have a passion on the welfare of people and being an economist as my background and also as a family person i've got three children and i am more interested in the welfare of not only my family but also my neighbors and also on the country as a whole but when you see that people are not enjoying their life to the fullest there is a problem and the issue here is we need to identify where the problem is and we all know that we've all been talking about you know african countries we come from a colonial background historical background mm -hmm. and it is important that we understand why is it we're in such a situation but what really baffles me about the welfare of african people is that we are living in the land of plenty abundance of human resources but people are very poor people have no employment people have no access to education people or in some countries they do people have no access even to simple medication where is the problem is it the problem of ODA not coming in the way it's supposed to be is it the conditionalities that are around the ODA is it the kind of leadership that is in our own countries so that's my concern and this is why I would I am focusing more on development aid we just want to understand why is it like that we have been receiving aid now for more than I think so for some countries it's more than 40 years but why is it is not making an impact is there something that is going wrong in terms of how we manage these resources or how we get these resources the reasons can also apply to the people who give us the ODA. They've got their own conditions. Mm -hmm. And you find their motive sometimes maybe not be, it's different. The motive, maybe the way we see it from outside, we think it's for development, mm -hmm. but it may not be. There are certain political reasons, there are certain foreign policy reasons that these people give their aid. And for that, they prescribe a certain, certain conditionalities around it for us to access, which has made it very difficult for our African countries. But when we look at also at our own African countries, how do we receive this aid? What do we do with it when we receive it? Are we putting it into productive use or we are putting it into other things? So this is the way I see it. It's too pro. Our own side, we're also partly to blame. At the same time, the people who give us aid are also partly to blame trend on ODA has changed completely. Uh, if you remember when they muted the idea of the MDGs in the year 2000, everything was focused on the ODA, that they are the ones who are going to assist people to achieve the goals that were the, the Millennium Development Goals. But I think the trend has shown us that it's not the case. There are also other sources of finance that we need for us to achieve our sustainable development goals. So ODA still has got a role to play to me. While now, after all those proliferation of other sources coming into play, ODA still has got a critical role to play, particularly for those countries that are not able to generate their resources domestically. And for also countries that are under the fragile states, or those countries who are in conflict, ODA still plays a critical role. But at the same time, even for those countries, like when you look in the middle-income countries, where they still have a number of people who are poor, we are saying we can use poverty, we can use ODA as a catalyst, sort of to get other resources, or you can what they call blended ODA, where you mix ODA together with the private funding. But there is a caution to it when you talk about blended finance, where you mix, or we could say public-private partnership, I think we need to put a caution to it. We need to be very careful, because you know when private funds come into the social sector, yes. it will really impact negatively yes. on the women, children, and the marginalized people. So while we would appreciate that the private sector can play a critical role, but I think they've been given that prominent role already. If you look what happened yes. in the Addis, and even yes. now, people are still talking, they are really emphasizing that the role of private sector. But really, we understand it's the engine for growth and it's all the engine for creation of employment. But let's be cautious when we apply or when we use private funds towards social sectors. We all know that when you have an educated women's society, it means the country also or the nation 
is educated because if the mother is educated it means the kids are educated it means the family is educated it means the whole nation is educated but we find women are found in the periphery in terms of the economic you know measurements we are the least people who are the least paid and most of them have not been accessible to education so you find most women are affected and once a woman is affected it means also children are affected it means a family is affected so i'm more concerned also about women and we are saying what kind of budgets do our governments give do they focus on women or the marginalized people at one point i was working as a consultant in terms when the, for the first time in Zimbabwe where they were trying to introduce what we call gender budgeting. It was very interesting for the first time that the government had to acknowledge that there is need in whenever we come up with our annual budget, there is need for us to focus on the women, children or other marginalized people, even the disabled people. Women in Zimbabwe, I would say when we look at the, during the colonial time and even soon after we, our independence we don't own anything because it's a patriarchal, patriarchal society where everything is owned by men, be it children, be it pro we are more like a property. But of course things have changed, the laws have changed and Zimbabwe has even adopted the SEDO. Yes, yes, yes. yes, and you find that women now at least they are able to own property even particularly when your husband dies, mm. you know, you are able to inherit some of the properties which was not like that before so we are saying but you find there are still challenges because there are people who try to follow traditional ways that women do not own anything so that struggle is still on despite the law being put in place because at the end of the day if a woman is good that experience sometimes you don't have money for a legal cost so at the end of the day you find women they suffer but we are saying we need to respect the women and when we say respect the women give them what is due also we also need to add value to the work that women she may be staying at home cooking for her husband but we need to add value to that work respect it and let's give it a value so it is really important that women's issues are addressed was to me as far as i'm concerned once issue for women are addressed it means issues for the children are also addressed so uh, in Zimbabwe, do the women have rights on property even when the husband is alive? Is uh, uh, can she own property or join yes. own property? No, they can own property. They can own, but do you find mm -hmm. most of the people they still hang on to the traditional mm -hmm. ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So you find here and there women really suffer, and you are always taking these things to court. But how many people can afford? to go to court. to court yes mm -hmm. but otherwise people now can own property mm -hmm. they can even inherit mm -hmm. property from their own husbands or even from their own families mm -hmm. like suppose if a family it's a family of three girls mm -hmm. and the parents they die today mm -hmm. we are entitled to that mm -hmm. as a woman I find in certain instances that when a parent dies mm -hmm. normally they look up to the son mm -hmm. to take over and sometimes you find a son may even chase the mother away from the house or you can sell the property. So you find those things are still happening. Because I think we still have that mentality that women do not own and, and are not supposed to own anything. With time, people will appreciate. But what is really needed is conscientization or education. We need to continue to conscientize men, especially men, yes. that they need to understand the importance of women. Mm -hmm. I think that's the whole thing. But if you see, I mean, even when you see in the... SDGs that are coming out, we're still focusing, there is also those SDGs that are focusing on women. Mm -hmm. So we're saying it's really important and I think the Pope has mentioned it. If you remember, he talked about women, mm -hmm. which means he really acknowledges that women are important. So to me, I think he has sort of blessed the SDGs and for those who have listened, definitely they will follow that path of trying to enhance or empower women so that this world can be a better world to live. No longer business as usual for post-2015. It's no longer business as usual. It's no longer way, the way we used to do things. I mean, during the time when we were implementing the MDGs, we have found that there are so many players who are coming into play. The role of civil society, it has been enhanced. The role of these other domestic stakeholders, when you talk about the parliament, we talk about local authorities, they also have a role to play. So we are saying, these people, let them give them their role, let them give them their space. And then we can see, once we have this inclusive development, 
definitely we can have very good results. But at the same time, what is important when I look at developing countries, there's this issue of ownership. Mm. Where we can have support from these people, because everyone is talking about partnerships. When we talk about partnerships with private sector, partnership with civil society, partnership with philanthropists, but let's not forget, ownership is key people or whoever come into this partnership with the government, particularly from the developing countries, they need to respect the government's priorities, the government's goals. So that's number one in terms of ownership. And also while they would focus on results, they also need to support our country results framework so that we are able to deliver good results. At the same time, I've already mentioned about inclusive development. Let's have all the stakeholders have a key role or a key or space for them to participate effectively in this process where we implement the SDGs. And finally, there's this issue of transparency and accountability. I think it's key. Whatever we do, if we don't become open and without making people know what is happening, I don't think we'll get anywhere. There's a need for us to be open up. There's need for us to be transparent and accountable to what we do. And not only accountable, like when I look particularly on developing countries, they got a tendency of being accountable to the donor and not their own citizens. It is really important that they become accountable to their own citizens and things will move well. That's my message for 2030. Uh -huh.